Hello and welcome to this episode of In Conversation with Reason to Be. Um, I'm Aurea Fellows and as usual I'm joined by my colleague um, Keith Goddard and today we're going to start by having a look at the importance of habits in relation to how we go about changing our behaviour. What we, what we know as psychologists um, is that lots of our everyday behaviour is a result of, of habits rather than choice. I think the estimate at the moment is about 40% of our behaviour. Um, and that's partly because, you know, as humans, we really like to run on rails um, and, and habits are a big part of what allows us to do that. And especially at the moment, um, things which are uh, routines or, or rituals for us are actually um, really important in terms of us being able to cope with um, the situation, you know, and challenges and lots of uncertainty, because they do provide a degree of sort of psychological safety. There's a degree of certainty and familiarity around um, things that we do that are that are very habitual. Um, but what exactly would you say a habit is, Keith? I mean, what would you say the key things that are involved and, and, and how do they work at a, a sort of a, a brain level, if you like? Cheers. Thanks, Aria. Um, yeah, so basics, basically habits in their simplest forms are little computer programs in our head, which therefore then guide our behaviour. Um, so a habit is a behavior, an action, a routine, or a set of behaviors, a set of routines that are automatically triggered by something. Um, and the simplest way, I guess, to get our heads into this is it's when we stop making a conscious choice to behave in a certain way. So our brain sees something as a result of seeing that something fires that gets us to do something. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's a little bit like a little computer program in our head. That's the, that's the way I think about it. Um, and there's a purpose and a meaning behind that behaviour as well. Um, so we don't just do it for fun. There's, there's, a, there's a reason and a purpose. As you said, about 40% of our day is, uh, is governed by these things. So when you break that down, what are the key components? Um, so there's got to be some form of trigger, some form of cue that tells us our, our brain that we, it, we want to do something. There's then a behavior and then there's a reward or a craving, I guess, of why we're doing that. So I guess to give you an example, car driving for a lot of us um, that have passed our test a long time, car driving is a very automatic thing. We don't ask ourselves to drive the car, we just go ahead and do it. So that could be touching the door handle, could be putting the key in the ignition, could be the, putting the seat belt on. But any of those acts for us individually will trigger our car driving habit or behavior. So that's, that's, that's how I would sort of conceptualize that, I guess. Um, I guess some of the things to think about, um, which are, I guess are interesting things about habits, are uh, habits are either un, are, in, are intended or unintended. So there are a lot of habits we have. We've never asked ourselves to develop that habit. We've just got a set of behaviors that happen automatically as a result of being triggered or cued by something. But there'll be some form of reward or craving that we get from doing that behavior. Um, some people may call some of these things their bad habits, I guess. So I've fallen into bad habits. Mm. Um, so we know within that, that bad habit will be a behavior cued by something or triggered and rewarded. Um, but equally, when you think about new behaviours, you can deliberately do all of that um, to, to, to set yourself up for success to do some new things. I think the other thing to, to bear in mind, just because we set our mind to, some, to doing something, um, doesn't mean that it'll stick. So we may say we want a new habit and go about to start for that, but it, it may not stick. And, and a couple of very simple reasons for that is, because we don't repeat the behavior over and over again. So what we knew about those little computer programs in our head is they've got to be repeated over and over again. So your brain hardwires them. Yeah? Right. So there's a, sometimes habits don't stick because they're not repeated. The other reason is, is because we don't reward that initial behavior to feel good about it and to get the brain to recognize it. Um, so, I guess one of the things to think about at the front end is, is really that repetition and rewarding to get our brain to recognize and to repeat. Um, so I guess that, that would be my opening gambit on how habits sort of work, I guess. Right. 
and, and I guess if we know how how they work, then we can actually take steps. Then if we want to deliberately be doing something, because mm -hmm. you know, I think it's it's good to hold on to that because when we actually want to make a change to our behaviour, you know, it's quite easy to go about it in the way that that actually might mean that we're not going to get um, the results that we are, we're looking for. You know, it's it's very tempting, I think, to to want to make kind of very wholesale sweeping changes when we set our mind to something. Um, but actually what the what we know that the research tells us from places like you know the behavior design lab they have at Stanford and others um, is it's actually best to focus on sort of one habit at a time um, because it's actually very difficult to to make massive changes um, all at once you know like you were saying um, cognitively it's quite difficult for the for the brain to focus on lots of new stuff all at the top at the same time um, especially when it's got existing computer programs running, uh, which might resist, um, you know, uh, those different changes. So I, I'm guessing that's why perhaps some of those New Year's resolutions that we make to drastically change our lives don't always turn out to be quite as life changing as we'd like them to be. Um, but what, what would allow us to, to be perhaps be more successful is if we if we start quite small, um, so I know that's something that I've often focused on is, you know, something we can do straight away that doesn't feel like it's a really big deal. Um, you know, I, I certainly think back to when I was sort of made myself a commitment that I was going to, you know, build more mindfulness into my sort of daily routine and my life. And I, I think I stumbled and gave up so many times before I realized I wasn't starting small enough. Um, and, and the breakthrough for me was was just starting with doing two minutes of mindfulness while I was brushing my teeth and um, you know that just helped me to keep it small and then led on to, to bigger things uh, which was actually you know the way to, to go about what I was intending to do um, but, but I suppose sometimes um, Keith you know what we want to change does seem like it's on a bigger scale um, so so what would you suggest in those instances where we want to start on something that actually feels quite big and quite chunky for us in terms of change. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's an important point. Isn't it? I guess the expression we would probably use is chunking it. Um, and I can't remember. I'm, I'm probably going to misquote this, but it's you know, eat, eat the elephant in small bites. Don't try and eat the all hell of all elephant. I don't know whether that's the right right um, sort of expression, but you know, there is a real danger that people say, right, I want to get fit and go out to get fit and then actually to stop very soon and that's because it's a quite a big amorphous yeah un, un, unusable sort of term getting fit so I, I, for me it's about breaking down that overall aim into bite-sized chunks to a point where actually you can do something really really simple today and tomorrow so it's picking out which bit of the elephant are you going to bite off first <laughs> you know, so is it going to have a nibble of its tail? Is it going to go straight for the trunk? Is it going to go for the toenail? But you're not going to try and hit the old elephant. So I guess if that, without stretching the, the analogy or the metaphor too far. So I guess for me, an example I would use is, you know, for me personally, you know, having not that recently passed a big milestone of age was actually, you know, fit in my 50s. But more specifically, and people probably laugh at this, is no moobs. So no man boobs was my sort of navigating beacon within that. Um, but then we'll actually, well, what does that actually mean? And then combining that with just the received wisdom about physical activity and good health, strength is, is one of the key assets that we should have in terms of good physical health. So for me, I just start with what, what I know right at the very end, the simple end is, I know I can do press-ups, not that many. So I'm going to start with press-ups and I'm going to start with how many I can do today. So I had a bit of a test and reckoned I could do probably about 30 to push but there weren't great press-ups. So actually I went back, oh well, good quality. So I started with 15 press-ups tomorrow. And that was just something very, very practical and tangible, where I knew it was part of a bigger plan to actually get fit, be fit in the 50s, be healthy. And uh, the, the, the subtext for that, or the, the navigating beacon for that was have, have, no, have no moves. Um, so yeah, don't know whether that's that lands with people or not, but hey, <laughs> well, that's I like the way it. I approach big elephant to get fit in my fifties to something really easy, simple to do, which is press ups, but good quality press ups. And and I guess that's the key, isn't it? Really, it's 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 picking something that will help us to overcome any procrastination, so we can just do something. 
um, I suppose it's, you know, it's like the Nike slogan, just do it. Uh, you know, just what would be the thing that would be a doable first step that feels that we can manage it and we can commit to it. So, so small enough that it will actually move us to action that there won't be a stumbling block because we think it's, um, it's too difficult or it's, it's too hard to accommodate at the moment. And I think that's why, you know, if we stick with the physical theme, you know, apps like the Couch to 5K, you know, mm. can be really helpful because it's something you can, you know, you can download on your phone and you can commit to right now I've got it on my phone. What, what day am I going to start? Um, but equally, I think sometimes those kind of apps, the downside is they go at the pace of the app. And sometimes you need to stick with, mm. you know, the thing that feels right for you. So I've, I've certainly talked to people that said, oh, well, then it got to the point where I was supposed to be running for 15 minutes and I couldn't do that. So I just stopped. Mm. And, it, you know, so that's the downside is, it, you know, you just got to keep on with the thing that's right for you. Um, you know, and it might be, you know, if you if you want to start doing stuff around journaling, maybe just commit to a very simple three three things I'm grateful about before I go to sleep, you know, which is mm. quite, quite simple in terms of journaling, just in terms of, you know, a step that you could perhaps quite easily do just on a scrap of paper, don't even need a nice, beautiful journal to do it in. Um, and, and, and I certainly know one of the things that I was, was looking to change several years ago was to, to stop eating gluten, which seemed like a really big change. So I think the thing that enabled me to get going with that was that I just decided I would start with my evening meals and I would just find some ways to not have to have gluten involved in evening meals because that felt like it was doable. And once I'd got that bit under my belt, because I could do it straight away, figuring out how to do some of the other stuff that was a bit harder um, sort of came along, came along afterwards. Um, so I, I think they're probably, you know, some of the things just about the size of it and just the immediate action. Um, that, well, I think it's, um, I mean, I think what pick up from that, I think there's a couple of key things, isn't it? One is, is building success into your new program and making the successes achievable and I think probably us included like everybody else we're surrounded by the apps that actually probably overtake us I remember a few years ago a good friend was needing to do mindfulness for some mental health issues and was getting overwhelmed with this practitioner who was trying to get to do 45 minutes of mindfulness when she's got a young toddler you know, and quickly she got set up for failure. So I guess, you know, building on what you said, I think there's really just making it real for us and figuring out, well, what's going to stop us achieving what we want to and not succumbing to what we're told by apps, what we're told by practitioners and making it real. And I think for me, there's a, there's a real bit around setting yourself up for success and accepting you will have trips along the way with your habits. You will fumble and fall but not seeing them as failure is actually saying them saying, okay, well, I've sort of fallen off the wagon and having a bit of a plan to get back on that. And I think part of that is just making sure you revise your behavior and your plan to achieve. And so the app thing, what you've said, if, you know, is if you're not getting to 15 minutes running where the app's trying to take you is, well, how do you revise your plan to keep on going with the behavior so your brain recognizes it but you don't feel like a failure because you're not up to 15 minutes. And I think that's for me is the plan revision and celebrating every success. So even if you're, you know, from a running perspective, which I do a lot of, even though if I'm not, I don't, I worry less these days about breaking my personal best every time because I'm quite injury prone because I'm older. The success I celebrate is the fact that I'm continually now managed to do quite long runs injury free. And if I'm doing good times, then actually that that's all to the good. But I guess it's it's understanding with myself with that if what what stops me doing it. So a good example for me was my warm up. So historically, got back a few years, didn't warm up properly, got injured, couldn't run, got depressed, la la la. Um, and now I just build a good healthy warm up into my running. But I've anchored that as a Pilates strength building warm up, even though it's not purely strength, to help me get out the door, you know. And for me, the thing that was stopping me out the door was the fear of injury, but equally not wanting to spend 20 minutes warming up. So I guess part of the whole, the whole habits thing and, and the behavior is understanding what, what will stop you from doing the thing you want to do. Um, so I don't know whether that helps people in terms of some top tips of just actually thinking about the behavior, new behaviors, starting small, taking small bites of the elephant rather than the whole big thing. Um, 
so I think that's that's what we would say in terms of the behaviors and general habits I think next time on the next podcast what we'll go into is just okay well how do you get those to work on a regular basis and look at rewarding your behavior and looking at the cravings or the why you're doing it in the first place which is really important and it's the it's the next phase of of planning your new behavior new habits so thanks very much for listening um, so that's podcast one on habits and look forward to listening uh, for you to joining us on podcast two